Hello, my name is Dr. Joanna Kuyaba, your spiritual detective who investigates with you the archetypes of the other goddess, spirituality and sexuality and goddess consciousness. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we have a special guest, Amanda Radcliffe, who is going to tell us about her unique journey in a moment. But please let me explain first why I invited Amanda to uh, show, uh, simply because, you know, in my book, The Ave Goddess, in part three, I'm discussing uh, Mary Magdalene in southern France, the possibility of that. And I have a special section on the Cathars. And uh, Amanda has a very unique story, her own story relating to the Cathar movement in southern France. So Amanda, um, can you tell me something about, uh, can you tell us something about your journey towards Cathars? You know, how did it all start? You know, like, did you wake up one day and, and what happened, right? Why did you even go to Southern France? It's a very strange story. <laughs> like a lot of our stories are yeah. who embark upon this kind of path, I think. Um, many, many years ago when I was at university studying theatre and feminist theology, I found a book in um, a little bookshop in the south of England um, by a man called Arthur Gurdon, who was a British doctor. And the book was called, um, what was it called? Reflections of Psychic Survival, Paradise Found, Reflections of Psychic Survival. And because I've always been clairvoyant since I was a child and it runs in our family, mm. It appealed to me and I thought oh, okay that sounds interesting I will I will get this book and the book was very surprising because it spoke all about how this man who was a very upper class British doctor who was an atheist educated at Oxford um, became obsessed with the Cathars because he was working in a psychiatric hospital and many of the women that he was treating were actually what he called repressed clairvoyance. And so they were having genuine visions, but because it was 1950s and 1960s England, nobody believed them. Mm. And so these women in the hospital started drawing Cathar crosses and writing in Old French and writing in Occitan and waking up with these drawings that they didn't remember having done. And because he was well-educated and he was a historian, when he studied at Oxford, he then thought, well, I have to, there's something happening here because there were more than one, you know, of these women. So he started to look it up and he discovered that these were real symbols and the women would sometimes speak in very kind of romantic, flowery language about dualism and about evil and about good and about, many of them were afraid of fire. And so he thought, okay, there's something happening here and I have to investigate. So bear in mind, this was 1950s, 1960s England. No one was speaking about the Cathars. This could not have been imaginary. Mm -hmm. And so he then took his own journey to um, investigate about the Cathars and he had to go to France to do that. Um, there was not much literature in England about this at that time. And he discovered that everything they were saying was true. So that started him on his own journey of discovery. So and can, I just, the, sorry, yeah? can I just interrupt? Because I just realized that I missed my introduction because not everybody is aware about Qatar. So maybe I would just mention that there are 12th century Qatar. It actually comes from pure. They called themselves pure ones. 12th century spiritual people who lived in Southern France had very interesting beliefs and we'll talk about it in a moment because we do not know much about them. They were persecuted by the Catholic Church and also the nobility from Northern France because Southern France was such an advanced region at the time. So, you know, everybody wanted the good, so to speak. It was like California at its best, you know, with many, uh, not only spiritual people, but, you know, arts uh, patrons and troubadours and poetry was born there and female troubadours. It was a very advanced region in France. And for some reason, also the Catholic church was after them because they didn't comply with the teachings of the church and they believed that they have more pure version of the teachings. So I think, and then 
And eventually during the crusade, which was launched against them, they were all burned at stake and, you know, at Monsegur, which is the last stand. So this is, this is what perhaps I should have said right at the beginning <laughs> of this interview. So uh, sorry to interrupt you. So just to give a little bit of a background to your own story and Gurdam's story as well, which I know, especially, I think I remember he was talking about Miss Miles there, you know, the right, one, yeah. Had, yeah, Miss Miles and I'm not sure Miss Smith, but I'm not sure, but That's I know right. Miss Miles. Yeah. And, and so uh, I didn't want to interrupt you just, you know, in, in, in the flow, but, but uh, just so some people who do not know much about Cathars mm. or have not heard of them, they know, you know, that it was a powerful movement, which was very brutally spiritual movement in the 12th century France, southern France, which was brutally repressed. And that's why these women probably had this kind of... Uh, memories of fire and so on because they were probably burn at, st at the stake right so j just with apologies for this interruption no no apologies needed and that was an excellent explanation brilliant explanation um i couldn't have said it better myself really you clearly have a very passionate interest in the cathars too um so that was how it began with me this book and it was many years ago i was you know really young when i read it and I could never have imagined what my life would have then led to. And so when I read it, it resonated with me. That's all I can say. And it made sense. And, but then it was um, only about 10 years ago where it really started to come back into focus in my life through a series of different events. And the main one was becoming involved in the Gnostic church um, in France. And it was through my ordination into the church, which, which was set up by a man called Jules Doinal, as I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. who was also a spiritualist. And he was given the information in the 19th century with Lady Kate Ness during a seance in Paris that you must recreate the Cathar Gnostic church. And 13 Cathars appeared in a seance and gave their names to him and to his witnesses. And Jules Donnell used to be a librarian in Orléans. And so he had access to hidden records that the public couldn't get at those times. And he managed to correlate the names of the 13 Cathars that gave their names. So what's interesting to me about this is that the Cathars, obviously they believed in reincarnation. And what is so strange is that it seems as if their spirits or part of their spirits have, have continued on and have made themselves known at the time when the prophecy was approaching, because obviously you'll know about the prophecy of Guillaume Balibast, who mm. said mm. in 1321, mm. in 70, 700 years, mm. the laurel will turn green again and the Cathars will return. Yeah. 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 So, but we'll discuss the prophecy perhaps a little bit later because it is a very interesting prophecy. But you know yeah. about your own journey again. So, how did you find yourself in France? So is was it the interest with the Gnostic Church, or was a series of events? What happened? A series of events. A series of events. Absolutely. Um, I knew clairvoyantly in two thousand and nine that I would be going to France. I just knew. I woke up one morning and I knew, and I became obsessed with France. Yeah. And I started looking at different places. No, that's not the right one. That's not the right one. And my partner at the time thought I was crazy because we had a very settled life in England <laughs> and it seemed very surreal to him. Yeah. And, um, and yet, so that was 2009. And in the same year, I had a very strange dream, which you probably heard me speak about in other interviews. But that dream I later discovered was... Um, the symbols in that dream led me to St. Sulpice in Paris. And from there I became involved with the esoteric orders and so on. So it, it all started with a dream. Mm. Mm. So very... little syn synchronicities, dreams, and being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people and being open to being guided, I would say. Yes, and having the courage to follow the symbols because you know how many times we receive the symbols, but do we follow them, you know, because it usually seems to be so counter uh, rational understanding of the mind of the world, right? Because our mind is screaming every time we get the sign, right? Yes. 
to take us out of there, so to speak, made <laughs> yeah, or air conditioning or air settle life. You know, you have a good life. Why would you leave it? Right? Crazy, crazy. But this is what you know pretty much every seeker in every tradition says. So just having the courage. So I'm glad you had this courage. So so how did you end up in southern France? So you were okay, in Paris. So, <laughs> so um I'd followed the signs and I ended up living in Paris. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a partner there who was a film director. So mm -hmm. we were living together, having a nice life in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I was working for um, an esoteric um, web TV channel there mm -hmm. called Bagless TV, um, which is all about French esotericism. And part of my job was to um, recruit speakers for our, our channel and to do research about them. And so during that time, um, I became involved in something called the Mary Magdalene Conference, which is also in France. Um, and through the organizer there, I, I got a couple of names of people that he suggested I could interview for the channel. And one of them was the name of a man called Richard Stanley. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted Richard and this is where it kind of gets a bit complicated because a few months before I contacted him, I'd had my own encounter with the white lady mm. that I've spoken about before, which was okay. totally unexpected. Okay, so could you share some spirit, because I know that you had some uh, ex spiritual experiences associated with the divine feminine. Would you like to yeah. share them with us and also as an introduction would you tell us about were you interested in the divine feminine in any form before that or uh, yeah were they unexpected yeah i was <clears throat> because <clears throat> excuse me um when i was a child please <clears throat> excuse me i'm recovering from the covid um <laughs> so when i was a child i always had the feeling that um god was near but god was feminine to me mm -hmm. And I was not raised Catholic, and so this was an alien concept. And I became friends with a Catholic girl in my um, area, and I used to sneak off to the Catholic church and pray to Mary, secretly pray the Hail Mary. Mm -hmm. And um, and where I grew up is an area with a lot of Irish immigrants, and so whether someone is Protestant or is Catholic, it still means something here. And it you know, they're not supposed to be friends because of the troubles in Ireland, but we were friends. And I became obsessed with the idea that here we had a feminine divine that I could relate to. And it felt more like what I used to experience. And so I was very disappointed in my church. We couldn't pray to Mary. We couldn't pray the Hail Mary. We didn't have the rosary. We couldn't mm -hmm. pray to the saints. It was, it was very boring and yeah. very masculine and it didn't feel right to me. So that was where it began. And then later on, I studied feminist theology at university. And that's when I became really immersed in the study of the lives of the Christian mystics. So Hildegard of Bingen, mm. Teresa de Avila, Julian mm. of Norwich, and so on. And again, I could relate to this very kind of embodied, sensual longing for the divine and, and this passion you know of the senses yeah. and this ecstasy that they were speaking of and I thought okay here's something again that I can relate to from experience and so that's where it really began but then like many you know young women I left Christianity behind because I thought well I can't be a hypocrite you know sex before marriage yeah. anti anti-homosexuality anti this anti that and I thought no I need to explore other things and then I never found my place in my explorations in the new age world mm -hmm. and or in other, other traditions or philosophies. And really I went to a little tiny chapel in Wales in my late twenties. And there I had a very powerful experience again of the feminine divine. That was my first embodiment in a place like a church. Um, and it was in a tiny shrine to a, a Celtic saint called St. Melangath. And I really felt her come into me. And that was when I realized, okay, there's something real here. There's something that I don't know about that's very, very ancient and I need to discover. So that was how it started. But again, I kind of kept pushing it under because I didn't want this life. I wanted the normal <laughs> life, you know, <laughs> didn't want this. <laughs> 
Yes. I tried. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, again, a decade later, it resurfaced. And that was when I realized, no, less than a decade. That was when I realized I can't escape this. It's just going to keep happening. And if I don't accept it, my life is going to continue to be derailed, which is what mm. happened. Mm. And so the first experience that I had, often in, in our tradition, we say, we meet the black Madonna before we meet the white lady. Mm -hmm. And that's because so many of us have had this experience whereby we meet the black Madonna before we meet the white lady. And that's how it started for me. I was working as clairvoyant. I did a reading for a man. And afterwards, just this experience of the Black Madonna just took me over completely. And um, I was taken into the cosmos, shown the workings of black holes and gravity and reincarnation and death. Mm -hmm. It was a very strange experience. Mm -hmm but it was an ecstatic experience and full of love and eros and sensuality and embodiment and beauty and a sense that no matter what happens here on earth and how terrible it may seem from her perspective it's all perfect mm. now that sounds really strange i know but and I got the impression that reincarnation is a choice that we are not sent down here as any kind of a punishment and you know coming back is is a conscious choice that the soul makes and we can choose not to come back also so that's a beautiful uh, very, as you said both spiritual and sensual experience and ecstatic experience and this is what i am interested in as well but can i ask you a very strange question so this black madonna did, did she have a face how did you have a sense that she is the black madonna she was a black uh vortex like a womb oh. Mm -hmm. like a circle like a mandala ah. um sparkling with little pinpoints of light that were zipping in and out mm. and i understood that they were lives every life not just human life zipping mm -hmm. in and out of her, her womb in a sense mm. and um coming in and out of of her realm but that we always exist within her realm we just are not aware of it and not only is it encompassing us, but it's within us. It's within every single atom, right down to the subatomic particles, which is why I was shown that we are not only held together by her love, but we are encompassed by it. So there's a kind of suction holding us together mm -hmm. and, and an external gravity, which holds the universe together. And that sounds hard to explain, but... <laughs> oh, it sounds perfectly fine because... Uh... I did, and I'm sure many people who are viewing this had similar experiences of cosmic consciousness, really, right? Whether, yeah, mm -hmm. it's it just in, for you, it was in the form of Black Madonna. So, uh, mm -hmm. a fantastic experience of cosmic ecstasy, of cosmic uh, consciousness. Thank you for sharing it with us here. And also, um, you said that you had other experiences because you said that the black Madonna usually precedes the, the, the white lady. So would you like to share that experience with us as well? Yeah, yeah. So it's strange because that experience led me to, because I had no context with this experience, by the way, this happened in mm -hmm. 2013 before I went to France. Okay. And it was only through talking further with um, one of my friends, Raylene Abbott, who wrote um, one of the first books on the divine feminine in fact about 30 years ago in France mm -hmm. um, about my experience that she helped me to understand who it was and set me on my pilgrimage to um, explore the Black Madonna in France so that was kind of how it started through that ecstatic experience of an imminent feminine divine um, personal personal interaction with, with such um, I then realized I had to follow this physically and go out into the world and locate the places and the positions where she also may manifest so I went to um, do a pilgrimage to Orceval in uh, the Auvergne region the Puy de Dome in France and in Orceval uh, sorry in Puy de Dome they have many black madonnas and it's very famous for that and no one really knows where they come from or why they are there mm -hmm. but the region is a volcanic region 
and it's very isolated and remote. So to travel there on foot would have been extremely difficult when these Madonnas were placed there. Mm -hmm. And they have so many stories about them. And this particular one that I wanted to see and do my pilgrimage to is a black Madonna that has been painted white recently. Mm -hmm. And she has gigantic hands and she's sitting in the hieratic position with Jesus on her knees, so like Isis. Yes. And she's very, very ancient. Yes. Mm -hmm. She used to be kept in a crypt and only brought out uh, four times a year. But recently, well, I don't know how many years ago now, but she's, it's a full-time pilgrimage site now. Okay. So she's always on display. Mm -hmm. And I'd read that there were many miracles associated with this virgin. And I wanted to go because I was praying for 200 people that day. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, let's choose a really powerful virgin and, and go. So I went with my partner at the time and we prayed late at night um, at the basilica because it was open all night mm -hmm. and as i was praying um i had a very powerful ecstatic experience of the energy under the ground like lifting me up mm -hmm. um and i went uh, back to the hotel our hotel was opposite the church directly in a little square with some shops and the church and our hotel and that night my partner was um, downstairs, but I was sleeping and I woke up and I had this white light dream um, in which the light was so bright in my dream that it actually woke me up. And then I opened my eyes and I realized I was not dreaming. It was there in the room and it took the shape of a woman and it had no face, but I could see there was a, a veil or a cloak where the head would be and a red light where the heart would be scintillating red light that's sparkling and I'd say she was about nine feet tall and she was hovering about three feet above the ground and then she's I was terrified I couldn't speak I was hiding under the duvet literally like this <laughs> myself to see if I was definitely awake but I was awake because I was so scared um and then she took as I say took a shape and then she spoke to me and she said People come here because they think they're coming to see the Black Madonna, but this is what I really look like. Mm -hmm. You called me, so what do you want? And I could not even think, let alone speak. I was terrified. And, <laughs> and so she extended a filament of light from the center of her, her body that scanned me up and down, like the center of my body for about an hour. Wow. I couldn't move, yeah. I couldn't move. So it was a, like a long encounter. It wasn't a mom, kind of one moment of vision, but it no. was like she stayed for one hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She wanted yeah. you. <laughs> I don't know why, but yes, it seems that way. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, and she, at, at, like after about an hour, she spoke again and she said, and this is where it gets really weird. Mm. what you want is the truth and the truth you shall have and if you want to know the truth about your boyfriend look on his phone <laughs> and I this said so I suddenly woke up out of like this trance and said what no <laughs> and then she disappeared so I was very disappointed okay. um but of course when my boyfriend finally you know came back into the room I had to tell him what had happened and then I said can I look at your phone and he said no <laughs> yeah, so there was something there right so there was something there that's quite uh, yeah. quite funny I know because when you have such a profound encounter you'd think we would be talking about the mysteries of the universe right exactly but it gets stranger still because um mm -hmm. the next morning after I had breakfast and you know talked about this we went to a little shop because i wanted to buy a knife to replace a knife i'd lost and it was the shop opposite the church so like i said there's a little square our hotel was here the church mm -hmm. the church was here and the, the the uh shop was there and i went in and asked the owner of the shop who was a man in his late 30s have have you ever heard of anyone having any strange experiences here like related to the the basilica or anything and i never told him anything and he said yes me and then he told me that one year almost to the day ago 
he went to the basilica to pray because he decided he was going to commit suicide um, his wife had left him and taken the children and he felt like he had no reason to go on so he went into the basilica and prayed and then that night he was in bed so bear in mind that his his apartment was above his shop so it was in direct alignment with our hotel and the church and he had a bright white light in his dream that woke him up and it was so bright that he sprang out of bed looking to see if it was coming from outside and there was nothing he got back into bed and it took the shape of a woman I'm getting goosebumps telling you this story yeah. because I was in shock when he told me and then he went on to say how the woman was about eight feet tall she wore a cloak she had no face she was made of light and she said to him do not commit suicide if you do this 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 and this will happen and then apparently told him all the reasons why his marriage had failed and how he needed to live his life from that moment on and he said that he'd always been very psychic as a child and very sensitive but he'd closed it down because of being a man mm. and because of that he closed down everything including his heart his emotions and that's why his wife had left mm. and so he was smiling and smiling, like telling the story and saying, oh, my life is, is completely different now. Um, the lady showed herself to me and now I know I'm never alone. Well, that's a beautiful story. Thank you. That's a beautiful story. So for you, did something shift after this experience with, with uh, yeah. you know, with the white lady, as you call, uh, the, you know, the encounter? Yeah. It changed everything. Of course, you know, in France, we have a long tradition of um, apparitions of Mary. So for mm -hmm. him, he thought he'd seen Mary, <clears throat> but I didn't know what I'd seen. Mm -hmm. I had no preconceptions. So I just called her the lady or the white lady. Mm -hmm. And um, it changed everything, that experience for me, because I felt almost stigmatized by it. Um, okay I, I met him and I could speak with him about it but no one else I knew had ever had this type of experience and it felt strange um and so when I was working for the web tv channel in Paris that I mentioned mm -hmm. I reached out to Richard Stanley the reason I connected with him was because he also saw the white lady but he saw mm -hmm. one in Montsegur mm -hmm. and he told me this is part of an ancient tradition in the Pyrenees and in France of sightings of the white lady that go back to Neolithic times. Yes. So it's not something new that's just come, you know, in Lord. Um, it's been happening for many, many, many generations. And we believe that the Cathars knew this, and that's the reason why they chose Montsegur and Occitania and the Pyrenees for their, their base, because we believe that they had encounters with her also with a living embodiment of the divine feminine that when I say living, I mean interdimensional. Yes, yes you know, of course, of course, interdimensional, interdimensional being. So this is very beautiful. Thank you. And it brings two things to my mind. One is that, you know, in because I was raised as a Catholic, I'm not anymore, although I had no bad experiences. I just it didn't explain anything to me. But it mm -hmm. gave me spiritual practice, which now I have, you know, I have a different spiritual practice, but at least I knew about spiritual practice and I knew about the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. But in, uh, in, in, in many regions of Europe, you know, they have apparitions of of uh, the divine feminine they call it virgin mary and i think because this is their reference but as you said point of reference right but yes. as you said it is a much more ancient uh, uh, being you know or may, perhaps a part of i would argue you know and this is what i'm trying to do in my book uh, that it's a form of our own consciousness of divine consciousness manifesting collectively for us and you know we just give it different names you know so because of a, right. a catholic past in europe you know people call it virgin mary but what is it really right this is i think this is exactly. our consciousness uh, bursting out you know goddess consciousness and uh, that wants to be noticed but these are beautiful stories thank you so yeah. much for this and uh, uh, there was another thing but i already carried away in a different direction that uh, i wanted to say so i moved to a uh to, to a, another question um 
you know, we actually know very little about Qatar beliefs, right? Because, and just mm -hmm. for, for the listeners as well, because they were basically all burned at the stake, uh, we know only some things like about many Gnostic uh, uh, groups that the enemies wrote about them. And yeah. in the case of the Cathars, we know uh, about their beliefs because you know how they, what they got out of them during the tortures, basically by, yeah. by the Holy Inquisition, you know, by the Dominicans. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so anything that I have learned, you know, in uh, when studying it, it was very bizarre because you know they were emphasizing very bizarre things just to yeah. discredit them. Absolutely. However, yeah, just to discredit them. However, mm -hmm. I think it is very interesting, and now even for historians who have no spiritual interest, just, you know, look at Cathars from a historical point of view, that, you know, they were the perfecti or, uh, who took the consolamentum, the, the highest form of uh, initiation to, to the Cathar movement and preaching, uh, very often were women. And in fact, Cathars encourage women and, uh, to... To, to take consolamentum, to be healers and preachers, which was uh, uh, quite common uh, in early Christianity, and it was repressed very, you know, soon afterwards, right? Especially mm -hmm. after the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century, and so on. And uh, in one statement, uh, one Dominican torturer <laughs> uh, bragged that you know he got out of the Qatar that um, you know they were uh, followers of Mary Magdalene that they believed that Mary Magdalene was more important than Virgin Mary because we know now although it is quite recent that they didn't think much of Virgin Mary because of their beliefs that you know mm -hmm. she was basically the body that brought Christ consciousness into the world. So they didn't dislike her, you know, but they thought it was just, it was her role. However, many of our churches were uh, named or consecrated after Mary Magdalene. So mm -hmm. uh, in my book, The Other Goddess, I argue that there must be some connection there between Mary Magdalene and Cathars. Do you have any knowledge or experience of this? And if not, that's fine. I, I'm just- I do, I do, I do. Um, one thing that I have is the oral tradition of Occitania. So living in Occitania for so long, um, I have met many people in the region, some people who had families who descended from the Cathars, you know, the, mm. the offspring who survived and people involved in different esoteric groups. And so I've, I've learned very much from word of mouth inner teachings of these uh, people and their family lineages. And so what I can say about this is that, yes, um, I have been told that the, the belief that um, Jesus and Mary Magdalene had children and offspring actually originated with the Cathars mm. and that they in fact believed that Christ was a man and that the Christ spirit came into, so Jesus was a man, the mm. Christ spirit mm. came into a man called Jesus and left him on the cross. Mm. And that's why he says, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm. So the Cathars believed that the, the Jesus um, was a man and Christ was a spirit. Mm. And so Christ spirit um, spiritualized the man Jesus mm. and Mary Magdalene. And he then went on to reproduce and create a spiritualized lineage of human beings who were um, more spiritually adept than those previously in existence, shall we say. So a line of elect, as we could say in Gnosticism. Um, and of course, now we know about this because we know about the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail and so on. However, the Cathars truly believed that they were descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And it's for this reason that when they were killed in Bézier during the terrible massacre, they chose Mary Magdalene's feast day, 22nd of July, and they locked them inside a church dedicated to Mary Magdalene and they set the whole place on fire. And 20,000 people died mm. during that um, persecution. And that's not an exaggeration. Some people have questioned me when I've said that, but it's not, I've read the records. Yes. Um, and so this is where that, Comes from and I have that on authority from people whose families were um, were, were Cathars. 
mm. in the past. So now I remember my other question, finally, that I had previously, which is basically, and, and I have two questions. I hope I remember the second ones and don't get carried away because it's so fascinating, you know. But do you believe that you are an incarnation of a Cathar? Wow, now that is a very interesting question. Um, I didn't want to believe that. Let's just put it that way. You know, I want this to be normal. <laughs> However, um, when I first went to Montsegur, um, I'll just briefly tell you the reason I ended up going to Montsegur is because I was told by a clairvoyant in 2016 that I would go to Montsegur and there I would recreate the initiation teachings of the Cathars and create the Gnostic Church. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, in 2016, I was living in Paris and I had no intention of going to Montsegur and I didn't know anyone in Montsegur. Mm -hmm. So two years later, I was living in Montsegur <laughs> <laughs> with Richard. Um, the guy I was telling you about who also saw the white lady so we connected through my job and we ended up together and he he introduced me to Occitania and to Montsegur mm -hmm. and so yeah and so when I first saw Montsegur I just cried because I felt like I had found I'd been searching for all of my life this place of home and uh, I, I felt that with all of Occitania it, it was the place I'd been searching for all my life. And then when I was living there, I had a lot of profound experiences, but the same clairvoyant and I were talking. And of course she was correct in what she'd predicted. Yes. Uh, and she said to me, you know, have you delved into what you remember yet? So I told her the things that I remembered and, uh, I remember dates and names and places and I kept saying to Richard because he was always obsessed with 1244 when all the cathars right. were burned and I said to him no it started in 1209 but I had no knowledge of this yes. no conscious knowledge and my memory was from 1209 from being outside uh, the castle walls in Carcassonne trying to get in to see my mother yes. um, and all of this came back to me after I went to Puiva Castle and I recognized, um, I recognized, I kept crying. I was crying at this castle and saying, this is not how it looked. This is not how it looked. This is all wrong. That's in the wrong place. This has been wow. yeah. demolished. Um, and I was, I was really upset. It was like a bleed through from this other mm. life. Mm. And um, when I went downstairs into the crypt, I recognized it as the crypt in my memory where my mother had her, her altar and her, her red book, her red Cathar book, which was in two languages. And this is what I remember. It was a red bound book. It was illuminated and it was in two languages. And when I went into the memory and Susan, the clairvoyant, helped me to remember these things, she didn't guide me in any way. She simply was there listening and taking down notes. She said, what do you see when you read the book? And so I read out what I could see and mm. the only language I could understand, and it was in Latin, but of course I don't speak Latin, which she does, mm. so she understood. Um, and the first lines of what, what I saw in the book was, this is the book of peace, is what it said. Mm. And the, the, the front cover of the book was an equal armed cross inside a, a circle embossed mm. in, in uh, some kind of golden substance. And all I knew is that this book was very, very precious to my mother. And in my memory, I went to the castle in Carcassonne to get her out of the dungeons. And they said they would let her go if she would recant, but she wouldn't. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I was very against Catharism in my memory. I was very angry with her about it because mm -hmm. I was quite young and you know I didn't understand. Um, and I thought it was anti-life in this memory. Mm. So it's not what I would have expected if I was making this up and I would have thought I was very pious, you know, <laughs> yes, yes. cafe. <laughs> I was very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing it with us. And now I will ask you a question that I know will upset uh, lots of people because I know lots of people are very interested in bloodlines and so on. But yeah. I'm not so sure. So, but I'm very open-minded and I will tell you why. 
because maybe because of my spiritual practice, I think what is truly important and I'm for our spiritual evolution individually and collectively is a spiritual practice, you know, work on yourself, take, take responsibility for your, for your evolution, right? Spiritual mm -hmm. evolution. So my uh, kind of argument against bloodlines, it's not like it's against bloodlines, but it is that there's a belief that some people are special and some people are not. And being a real or imaginary a descendant of, of uh, Jesus uh, frees you, you know, from not having a spiritual practice because you're special already, or, you know, makes you something, somebody better. When I think in this conscious universe, we're all evolving and there are no special, uh, there are no special people, so to speak. So you, you understand what I'm trying to say? That it's not I'm just sorry. claiming, oh, I am from this lineage and especially also new age movement. You know, I met so many special people and so many Mary Magdalene's, you know, and oh, yeah, I, me too. <laughs> so, so, you know, and I'm not uh, making fun of anybody's spiritual experience. I believe that spiritual experience is spiritual experience, but not mm -hmm. what I have problem with. I'm not against anything, but what I have an maybe uh, concern, you know, about is that then they make them some special, special and then you know uh, others are below them when i think truly spiritual beings never feel this way right so if you would like to elaborate mm -hmm. about the bloodlines and so on and also where you're doing it do you think if you do believe in bloodlines that there's something special about particular uh, type of bloodline because i know it's a um yeah so and so I I, i'm very open-minded and i'm happy to be convinced i'm just saying this one yeah. aspect only bothers me that you know, people think that they are special and, and they're more spiritually evolved, which I personally think is actually not spiritual in itself. The yeah, like what, I will, <laughs> what I will say about the concept of bloodlines is um, things like psychic ability have been proven to be inherited. I mean, that's why so many families, it runs in so many families. And from what I understand about the bloodlines, it's simply that um, people with psychic ability so we're not talking about Jesus here, we're talking about mm. pre-existing uh, shamanic practices, mm. we could say, in, in uh, pagan societies. Yes. Um, so how I understand it is that is that pre-existing psychic or people with healing abilities and so on um, reproduced with others who had the same skills to continue on the gift of being able to access interdimensional consciousness for the purpose of the tribe. So mm. it was never for self-aggrandizement. Mm. It was because the tribe in the, in the ancient days, the leader was not only the one with the biggest muscles or the biggest store of food or you know, the, the mm. biggest weapons, the, the real leaders in shamanic traditions were those who could foresee what was coming. Mm. So who could say, don't do that, don't go there, take this option, don't take that one, because those who can foresee can then divert and avert the disaster that's mm -hmm. coming. And so from my understanding of the, the bloodline mysteries, that is a very, very important piece, mm -hmm. because it goes back to way before Jesus. Mm -hmm. It goes back to how things were in, in tribal times. I mean, imagine living through the ice ages and all mm -hmm. the different disasters that our ancestors have. Uh, live through so for me it has a very practical um, mm. significance and that's how it came into my life through the people that I met and that's how they explained it mm. and what I'll say also is that the the gifts come with disabilities also mm. many people who have these bloodline abilities also have allergies um, autoimmune conditions um, can't bear to be in the sun um, you know, have all kinds of things. Some are hermaphrodites. I've met several people who come from these bloodlines who have deeply kind of interbred with each other over generations and, and they have they are hermaphrodites. Mm. Um, several have connective tissue disorders, you know, so it's like um, it's like these spiritual gifts come with physical costs. And, and so this is why I'm a proponent of this because I understand from personal experience that the, the gifts are not given without a price that we have to pay. And we are not rewarded for those gifts in our society the way it is today. In fact, we're told you're crazy. This is not real. You don't exist. 
yes. you know like psychics what what are psychics are you yeah. psychotic <laughs> you know i really like your explanation and this is what um, i think my um problem was with uh, with other explanations because people i've met considered themselves really special when it was actually uh, people with gifts which were passed genetically on which is normal right like anything else like the color of eyes mm. and so on uh, was for a collective evolution you know perhaps also for survival yeah. regular survival as you said ice age and so on but mm -hmm. uh, but for for our collective evolution so it is a, a this is for everyone right so this is for everyone it's it's for, for survival of the yeah. tribe yeah i'm not sure are you familiar with the work of dr elaine aaron who's written a book called the highly sensitive person no i didn't read she, oh she says um she gives another piece to this she says that 20 percent of all species including animals are born highly sensitive with what could be termed intuitive or psychic abilities. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. I actually think that animals are more psychic than most humans. You know, I love it. <laughs> because they, <laughs> they can communicate with us telepathically, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they are very emotional and so on. And, you know, yeah. I never shared it with anyone else, but for example, my grandmother definitely had abilities. And uh, I think I inherited some of them. I never worked on them, but just, you know, they are useful in my spiritual practice, right? But I mm -hmm. think it's skipped generation, I think, in, in, in my- And actually, yeah, I'd like to say something else about that. I'm um, getting back to what you asked about mm -hmm. spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Having the bloodline, one of my teachers said to me, it means nothing. It's about what you do with it, how you use it, not for your own benefit, but to help others. Yeah, and he was you. very, very angry about a lot of the people that you're talking about. He had no, he had contempt for them. <laughs> yeah, thank you for this clarification, because this is, you know, especially in new age parlance, it means, you know, I'm special. So, yeah. uh, so that, with, to that, what you have just said, you know, I can completely relate. And could you comment, uh, because there is lots of, um, uh, you know, um, discussion about types of actual blood types. You know, yeah. do you think it relates to this too? Um, I did a study with a man uh, called Dr. David Ritchie. We worked, I helped him with some of his research for a book he wrote about this. He's passed away now, but he studied um, people who, who were what he called anomalously sensitive for mm -hmm. 30 years mm -hmm. in, a, in a clinical facility. And he discovered again that many people who were there with labels like borderline personality disorder, psychosis or whatever, were actually clairvoyant and psychic and nobody believed them and who were receiving information all the time and didn't know how to filter it out, mm. including some autistic people. Yeah. Um, in his research, he did find that there was a correlation to psychic ability and um, different blood groups. He did find that, but mostly with the rhesus negative, he did find there was a higher proportion of people rhesus negative that had these abilities. That was his research. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I personally that, don't know. That's my blood type too. So. <laughs> well, there you go then, you see. <laughs> so maybe I am resisting inevitable. I, I think know. you're resisting, John, I do. <laughs> understand. So. Because some people also, uh, uh, because I also love the work of uh, Professor Pasulka, who talks about spiritual experience, uh, spiritual experiences in American cosmic spiritual experiences and UFO uh, phenomena oh. and so on. Fantastic work. I highly recommend it. And, you know, some people believe that, again, people who uh, had contact are abductees or something are of the same blood type. So, you know, maybe oh. they're just open to other experiences, right? So, uh, and then I maybe think just so. deeper psychic uh, abilities or, you know, what is UFO? Uh, for example, Professor Pasuka, and I agree with her, although I'm not a specialist on this, just reading her books, is that it is basically an experience of some interdimensionality. Exactly. You know, it doesn't exactly. have to be like a spaceship on the sky because you can have people and some people see it, some people don't see it. How can yes, you explain, right. right? Something like that. When with a spiritual experience, it can be either collective or individual, right? And and yeah. and so so that's that's another very interesting area that I'm just starting to explore. 
So thank you for this clarification. I really appreciate your research and your work in this area. And also because at the beginning you mentioned it and I just wanted to keep it till, till the end. We're talking about the Qatar prophecy and the mm. and Balibas, right? The last, they call him the last Qatar as far as we know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and you know very colorful person, but he had a prophecy. And what do you could you explain to us? What is this prophecy? What this prophecy is, and how what do we do with this basically? Because uh, you have to admit, you know, you know, on this planet we went through many strange times. But this, you know, at the moment, last three years, and I don't think it's ending. We are going through some okay. major shifts, and somebody is playing mercilessly with our consciousness you know they are <laughs> that's a good description <laughs> yes well um before I, I get into that I just want to say that Richard and I made a film a couple of years ago with Nicolas Cage um called Color Out of Space mm -hmm. and it's based upon the H.P. Lovecraft story and we filmed it in Sintra and it came out just before Covid exploded and um, in the film, it's all about an alien virus that comes on a meteorite, infects the water supply, and it changes everything that surrounds it. Wow, and I just got cold shiver, you know, now, like yeah. <laughs> you're saying this. Yeah. I relate this very strongly to COVID. There is a theory that COVID did come on a meteorite that fell north of Wuhan just before the whole thing blew up, literally. Mm. Um, and uh, that has been put out by... Um, uh, an astrobiologist who came up with the panspermia theory with his colleague Fred Hoyle mm -hmm. many years ago now and we put this in the movie we were talking about how consciousness can enter our universe through through space mm -hmm. and um, the viruses and so this was an alien virus that came on a meteorite infected the water and changed everything that surrounded it this was our film that came out two months before Covid arrived wow Talking Globally. about consciousness exploding, right? Con yeah. I think consciousness wants to know itself through us or want to be, rec you know, or recognized exactly. in us and through us. So that's, that's right. And I think the virus wants this also. Mm -hmm. When I tuned into the virus, that's also what the virus wants. Yeah, you think so? To experience our consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't mean to harm us, it's just mm -hmm. accidental. And that was the story in the movie that the, the I know it's a diversion from your question, mm -hmm. but I have to say it because um, it's related to the prophecy in some way, I believe. Mm. Um, it's no coincidence that Richard and I were the only two English speaking guides in Montsegur at the time when all of this happened and we just mm. made this film. Yeah. Um, and uh, when I tuned into the, the, uh, the virus and it first happened, that's exactly what I received, what you have just said, that it wanted to experience our consciousness. And it didn't mean to kill us, it was accidental. And, and the colour in the movie communicated with me, with Richard and with our clairvoyant Susan <laughs> and with the mm -hmm. I don't want to be seen as evil. Mm -hmm. I want to be seen as beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm not evil, I'm just matter in the wrong place. Oh, that's a story, you know, for many of us, I guess, right? Like, yes. we're just... Uh... <laughs> consciousness embodied consciousness except yeah. that you know uh, if i can just uh, say something here that you know in my book i want to say that we should enjoy this embodiment that's why i also talk about you know sexual ecstasy or erotic ecstasy and spiritual ecstasy you know and so yeah. on because uh, i think there's a lot of uh, rejection you know oh. of, of 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 sensuality especially in spiritual domain and i think that's wrong because there are traditions who mm. celebrate it you know uh, i agree i think spirituality but perhaps i am digressing again so no you're not we have so much to talk about joanna i just want to say that that's why i think mary Magdalene is so important as an icon for our times mm. absolutely i completely agree you know she is the, the spiritual and erotic goddess you know so to speak yeah uh, so and 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 our consciousness is seeking that you know That's so right. um what about the prophecy, prophecy and what we do with yeah. this you know because so, i think we need some practical advice here too <laughs> yeah the prophecy came about um so the reason i mentioned the pandemic and the movie is because the prophecy happened on the tail end of that mm -hmm. so 2021 
mm. is when belly burst um 700 years after when he made that prophecy mm. and before that prophecy happened monsegur was decimated by box tree moths from uh china we had a plague of moths oh. before we had a plague of covid and so the mountain started to fall apart. Trees were being uprooted, oh, wow. rocks were falling onto the ground. All the roots of the trees were being eaten away by these moths. We couldn't get rid of them. I mean, they tried all kinds of things. They went through the whole of Occitania and in different parts of France. And then literally we thought the mountain was never going to recover. Most of the trees were dead. Um, and yet, just before the prophecy, the laurel turned green again, literally the mm. trees on the mountain that were decimated by those moths started to get green again. And so we mm. saw that as a literal embodiment of this prophecy. It was no coincidence. But what did the prophecy actually say? Can you tell uh, Alice? Yeah, it said in 700 years, the laurel will turn green again, the laurel being one of the representations of the Cathar faith. Good men and women shall return. So the good men and women, as you know, that, that was the name the Cathars gave themselves. Mm -hmm. They were called the good men and the good women to, the, to themselves and each other. And so for Balibast, he was trying to say, you can kill me, but you can't kill our faith and you can't kill our reincarnations. Mm. You know, you can take my life now, but I will always return because we will always return. And that's the story of the Cathars that I've heard again and again. The same phrase that we shall always return. Mm. It's what I've heard so many times in Occitania from so many different people, including the story that never ends is another phrase that we hear. Mm. And why? The question is, why should we return? Why should we keep returning? and what is asked of us now. And so I, I really believe now having immersed myself even more deeply into, into the energies and the, the um, representations and the, the memories of the Cathars now, that they had a technology which enabled them to walk into the flames without fear. Mm. And maybe that's what we are now being asked to rediscover, how we can walk into the flames of this terrible annihilation of everything we've ever known, which is happening at the moment without fear. Mm. And how did they achieve that? Well, they believed, first of all, that we are not only this body. However, mm. that did not mean that they denied the flesh. And this is a mm. lie that has been mm. propagated. Mm. Cathar families were always very large. Esclamon de Foix had nine children who survived mm. Mm. and went on to be the high priestess of the Cathars. Mm. If they believed that sex was wrong and evil and mm. the body was sinful and disgusting and that women were, you know, evil temptresses, why have so many children? Mm. Mm. It doesn't make sense. Mm. And the Cathar faith was propagated through the women and I found records that prove this. Um, that grandmothers were educating granddaughters in special schools that were set aside for this purpose in different locations. Mm. And Esmond um, herself was the one who insisted upon using Monsegur mm. as an initiation retreat for Cathar women. That's how it was before it became the hide hiding place for everybody, mm. um, for the survivors. It is um, I'm sorry, yeah. continue, continue. No, please go on. It is interesting to me as I'm listening to you because the same story seems to be repeated in all traditions. I studied very deeply tantric traditions because my interest in spirituality and sexuality and the same story happens, you know, very secret knowledge was transmitted from, from woman to woman, from yogini to yogini, from dakini to dakini. And they had special powers in a sense that were both interdimensional and, and human, you know, because of our spiritual practice, or I don't know, now maybe bloodline, I don't know. But uh, gradually, you know, the closer we get to our times, they were either, you know, forgotten or ridiculed or because that tradition was orally transmitted, eventually it was written down by male scholars and they actually started to use the rituals you know for yes. their own benefit by using by using women and this divine That's energy true. you know that is within a 
female body. So uh, it's very interesting for me to hear, you know, that in, and I know that, you know, Qatar's obviously, you know, had uh, female teacher, teachers and so, and so on and preachers, but that this tradition is so old and it was actually passed orally also from a woman to a woman from That's generation right. to generation. Yeah, and that was not because they were segregating the sexes because they thought it was evil to keep them together. That was not why yeah. at all. It yeah. was it was very much a woman's tradition yeah. and propagated by the female in the family almost every single time from my research. Yeah. Um, and also just to add to that with your interest in Tantra, which I've also studied a little, um, it was said that there was a tantric tradition within the Khazar faith. Oh, really? Which, which connects in with the uh, practices and the rites of the troubadours. Mm. And that the troubadours and the Cathars are basically one and the same. I discovered this very recently that the Cathars worshipped something known as the lady. Mm. And that this is um, where the cult of Mary, in fact, comes from. Mm. You spoke about the Dominicans and how they they were present in the Languedoc they were present there because they wanted to get rid of this heresy yes. they tried by introducing the worship of the virgin which was never there before the crusade against the Cathars mm. that's and right so, so look out everyone because the goddess is on the rise you know and and it I think it is the consciousness is breaking in all the right places right now but also I think there's a more pressure to repress what I call goddess consciousness simply mm. because you know the, the rise of technology also which is very much I would say and nothing against technology we are talking together because of technology but putting all our faith and giving up our spirituality for the sake of technology I just intuitively know deeply in my gut that it's a very wrong turn and you know on the last page of my book I just say make a turn make the other turn you know don't go where everybody else is going like in the film you know Midnight Express I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember this film the mm -hmm. prisoner starts to he has this moment of awakening it's a fantastic moment when the prisoner starts to they all walk in one direction and this one man the main character starts to walk in the opposite direction and it is a moment of fear and the moment of complete freedom <sighs> So, you know, this is what I'm calling for, and I'm sure that this is what you're calling for in your work, and I'm calling for in my book, because it is not just, and this is what I want to, uh, our listeners to know, it is not just about talking about ancient goddesses, this is not, you know, who they were, uh, it's a good start, this is not just talking about who Cathars were and what they did, and yes, it was unjust what was done to them, but what we are going to do with it now, you know, so exactly. as you said, like, so this is this prophecy, but what now? You know, be embodiment of this, right? Exactly. Be embodiment of this. And our times are calling for, for this different turn because otherwise what, uh, you know, others that assume power over us, plan for us is simply unacceptable. So we have to have yes. this courage and we have to have a spiritual resolve. That's and right. Well, in, in, in a way, we are going through a crusade against our unconsciousness right now. Mm. Uh, um, absolutely. That's well, really well put. A crusade against our consciousness. Yes. And somebody, yeah. you know, it sounds like a science fiction movie, but it feels like somebody <laughs> has to harness our consciousness, but do not let them, right? Like you claim your consciousness, you're the part of cosmic absolutely. consciousness, of divine consciousness, and what I call just uh goddess consciousness right in in mm -hmm. uh not that it's uh, anything against men absolutely not but this is this other form of consciousness that was repressed both on women in women and men absolutely. it was a fantastic conversation amanda would you like to add anything else um i'd like to ask you a question actually if i might <laughs> okay sure <laughs> um one thing that came up when we were talking is I thought about when people are suffering, it, there's a real urge to escape the body mm. and there's a real urge. And I think that's where a lot of these negative um, Gnostic beliefs have come from, which then permeated through into Christianity with this dualism, mm. um, good and evil and everything else. Um, and I think it's, it's a, 
the men, you know, men came up with these uh, these beliefs. Mm. Um, seeing women as the cause, I'm sure you've read some of these Gnostic uh, texts mm. in which they mm. talk about the womb as like the evil trap that traps the yes. sparks of light and so on. And then, of course, we have Eve and the temptation story in the Bible that led to the fall. And what I'm, I'm wondering is, I think that there's um, a genuine pain, a, a suffering that has been behind the creation of these beliefs, these metaphors, these stories, mm. um, because of the uh, universality of suffering. So how can we, in your experience, um, continue to be in our bodies during times of suffering, which I think a lot of people are going through now? That's a very good question and a very difficult question, I must say. And historically speaking, just first I refer to historical thing. I can understand, although, you know, it was turned into something really evil unnecessarily when people were saying if woman's body, you know, is this trap because there is the temptation, you know, which is this, you know, attraction, right? But on the other hand, on the one hand, on the other hand, that means children, childbearing, and, you know, it's very difficult to come... Uh, you know, to do your spiritual practice when suddenly you have nine children, unless you're your parents, yes. right? And so on. So I understand this, although it was turned into something evil, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a question that I think for millennia we're asking ourselves. But uh, the, what I have learned from uh, the tradition of, of, of esoteric tantra, you know, let's put it esoteric tantra, everything is consciousness. And if we yeah. can only remember and it's very difficult that we are this embodiment of this consciousness in all its forms, you know? And this is, and suffering, unfortunately, can be a part of that, you know? Like mm -hmm. we, we all suffer and we all eventually die. So in some forms of esoteric Hinduism, we talk about the non-attachment, but I don't think it's very healthy, right? I no. think that we have to, it is almost like, for me, it's almost like a cosmic journey. We have to enjoy this journey. And like, you can have anything you want, but with consequences. And I think we are this consciousness embodied, you know, and we made this choice. I agree with you when we we're talking about it at the beginning of our conversation. So we made certain choices, even if we do not remember them. Mm -hmm. There's this fantastic story in esoteric tantra when you know the, the goddess, the goddess consciousness embodies herself, which is really a Gnostic story of Sophia as well. You know, she sees something and it's attractive it's below, and she embodies and she forgets who she is mm -hmm. for a while. And at certain moments she wakes up, and I think we are at the moment of awakening as well. We are the Sophias, we are the Shaktis, you know, who we fell into this experience, but by choice, it's not a tragic accident. Yes. We went into this experience and now we are awakening. You know, we are going, like I'm saying in my book, walk in the opposite direction now because it's the, mm -hmm. the path of awakening, you know, and we have to go through this. However, embodiment also creates suffering as much as joy and that's the deal as long as we are in you know this three dimensions there is no escape from this and i think that i understand why this big tech and so you know pharmaceuticals they think apart from their own agendas you know they want to free us from the suffering and it's in some ways noble but what i'm saying it, it is a part of human experience and for me prolonging life in unnatural ways is not the answer because you know it was meant to be a trip you understand yes. it meant to be experience of embodiment and we are belonging here for a moment and we chose this moment even if it seems incomprehensible sometimes especially when we see suffering of the ones that we love or you mm -hmm. know our own suffering you know i would never deny suffering in the world mm -hmm. but as strange as it seems, you know, we did choose it and it is an experience and it will pass. And we actually uh, are much bigger than this experience and, and we belong also somewhere else. And this is just a temporary experience. So I'm not sure if it makes any sense, but okay. it, so, but, but uh, it, it is like when you go on any adventure, you know? So for example, you're like mountain climbing, you know, uh, there will be, there will be a, 
ecstasy, there will be highs and there might be consequences. And we knew when we embodied mm -hmm. that these are the consequences, you know, as Buddhism says also, mm -hmm. right? There is mm -hmm. suffering and there is death. And that's a part of human condition, but being human is just an experience. We are more than that. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is the only um, way I can explain that. I love what you said. And I really love what you said about needing to enjoy the embodiment mm. enjoy the experience because too many of the the uh eastern traditions again speak about denial of the body mm. denial of the emotions especially samsara maya mm. um mm. feelings don't matter it's all an illusion or it's a trap mm. and i i feel that dualistic that extreme dualistic uh ideology is against the feminine it's against this totality that we're speaking of which i mean to give birth is an extremely painful experience yeah without it none of us would be welcome here to the world welcome to the world yeah. you know, for the mother and for the baby so this is the body so i would say look around you know i, I live in subtropical australia by choice it's a choice right <laughs> so I, I love it you know it was a lot long journey for me and, and the tropical birds are singing you know and there are beautiful trees and there are all kinds of natural disasters it's australia everybody you know hears about it on the news but <laughs> this is the body of a goddess that's goddess consciousness it's and what is goddess consciousness it's what's called prakriti in, in tantric hinduism which is basically this is the embodied consciousness consciousness that is in action because the other form of consciousness is a, is asleep right yeah so it's there it, it, it is perfect there is no suffering but there is no ecstasy either and there oh. is, and this consciousness you know seeks this ecstasy and we have this opportunity to experience this ecstasy but there is no ecstasy without pain you know in our dimension at least and i think this is probably the most exciting with all dimensions you know for people who want to ascend and so on you know everybody wants to ascend and move on to a different levels but this is like this is your adventure you know mm. and 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 it, it's not supposed to be an easy if it's easy it's not an adventure okay so this is your adventure claim it enjoy it and yes there will be pain thank you thank you so much so uh, uh, amanda it was a really wonderful conversation i'm really grateful for this please tell uh viewers how they can connect with you and i'll leave also the link to your school and but would, okay. you, uh, yeah, sure. would you like to say something at the end uh, about your school or yeah so i run a um, mystery school i take only a handful of people every year mm -hmm. and it's passing on the things that i was taught in my own ordination training and different esoteric groups in France, which I've been permitted to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's very different than what's available in the New Age movement. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit more academic, but it also involves serious practice. Mm. Um, and if anyone's interested in finding out more about that, they can look on my website, which is my name, mandamariamneradcliffe.com or find me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So this is the best way to contact you via your school or via your Facebook page, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And for people who want to connect also with me, you know, I'm here on this channel. And also, once again, you know, please, if, if you want to delve more into this, check out my book, The Other Goddess. Uh, I <laughs> bury my soul there. So it, it, it was... Uh, quite a process spiritual process actually writing of this because i just went for it you know no more hiding so mm -hmm. uh, the way i guess like you're doing now right amanda you just yeah this is it you know no more pretending yeah you have mm -hmm. to be real right yeah we do we have an obligation because of mm -hmm. the gifts we've been given that's right so once again thank you so much amanda amanda until next time until next time thank you joanna